Hey everyone, you're listening to an episode of the Artist Corner featuring our Artist of the Month. We hope you enjoy this Black Ops Toy Story show available on YouTube and YouTube Podcast. All right, here we go. All right, Dean, we're super excited to have you as our Artist of the Month this month. So I guess start off by telling us, you know, about yourself a little bit and then what kind of got you interested in um, action figure art and how that started for you. Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for having me on here. It's a real honor to be considered to be part of the group of guys that you've had so far on here. So really great artists. So good to be counted among them, right? Uh, so how I got started is kind of a twofold thing, right? Um, lifelong toy collector. Uh, you know, grew up in the best time to be a kid ever in the 80s, right? So um, everything that should never have been toy lines were developed into toy lines. And then, you know, then we had the awesome cartoons, which were commercials to buy toys. Uh, so it was perfect. And growing up and all that uh, just kind of started a lifelong appreciation for the hobby. And, you know, I would say it was probably in the 90s. I started realizing, why aren't they making things that, that were in the movies, right? So the first thing I ever customized, I can recall, um, was, uh, I believe it was Batman Returns. So Kenner had the license for that. They got it from Toy Biz after the first Batman movie. And so Kenner reissued, um, they had some really good Keaton sculpts in their Batman figures, but the Penguin was just a reissue of the old Kenner superpowers uh, penguin looked nothing like Danny DeVito so I remember getting some craft paint and I painted his costume black and did the dots the white dots on it and I had some yarn and that I glued for the back of his hair you know and so I was like you know I just want I wanted a penguin that looked like the guy in the movie so and that that really kind of started my I guess the itch I had to scratch for customizing it was like why don't these things look more like they're supposed to and so that moved on into a couple of other little customs that I did, and then that went dormant for a while. And I remember when the Transformers, the first Transformers movie came out. I noticed guys on eBay were selling repainted Transformers. So they would do like a black, you know, black base coat with like a dry brush of silver and stuff like that to make them look more like the movie version. So I started doing that and started selling them on eBay, and I thought, you know, I can actually start to make money in this kind of a hobby. And... So that kind of led down the custom road and I got into customizing hot toys after I started uh, getting into six scale, right? I saw the first, the first six scale figure that I ever noticed. I saw a review for the Takara Tommy um, Batman Begins. Oh, I don't remember the year that Batman Begins came out, but that was around the first time that I got really introduced into six scale. And I saw some of the hot toys, military figures, right? Cause they weren't mainstream in America yet at all. Right? Not at all. And so the movie characters were really kind of the foothold into getting them into the U.S. mainstream. Because um, I remember going to a local comic shop. I was like, have you guys ever heard of Hot Toys? And they looked at me like I had two heads. It's like, what are you right. talking about? You know? <laughs> Probably thought I was asking for something pervy. Some, so something expert. dirty, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. And uh, so I explained to them what they are. And they're like, we never heard of them before. So, you know, we're, we're going we're going way back here. We picked up the the... Batman Begins, and then Hot Toys came out with theirs, and so it was like, now it was a race of, well, who had the better movie figures, you know, and so I really got hooked into Six Scale, because it was, it was a culmination of things that I liked as a child, you know, of toys and cool characters, but then they were, now they're hyper-realistic, which is kind of funny looking back now to the level that they were then, they were mind-blowing, like the Mark III, from Iron Man, you know, Blue that Man, yeah. it was, it was next level, but now that looks like a cheap toy compared to like their die cast release they had years later and so on. So, um, so yeah, I started doing, uh, I opened up for a set of commissions to do battle damaged Mark threes based on the end of the film. So I would get a Dremel tool out and just start scarring up the armor and stuff. And people were like, dude, you're so brave by <laughs> messing up these hot toys figures. But I would do dry brushing on them and weather effects, you know. And so I was doing that kind of work for customizing. And um, it was around the time that I think The Dark Knight came out. And there was a sculptor at the time. His name was Adam Goo. Uh, still is a sculptor. Phenomenally talented guy. Uh, Lamb Over Me, I think, is his handle that he uses. So a lot of people will know that name. And he posted a work in progress that he was doing. It was a six-scale sculpt of Bruce Wayne. And 
everyone was like, oh, can I get one of those? That looks fantastic. It was better than what Hot Toys had put out as far as likeness at the time. And so everyone was chomping at the bit for it. He's like, I, this is just a hobby. You know, this is just something I'm making for myself. So I wrote him in private and I'm like, look, man, I said, I'm kind of a business mind guy. I've been doing graphic design work on the side for my regular full-time jobs for years. I thought, I tell you what, um, let me have that. I'll make copies of it and sell them. You'll get a cut of it. And all you have to do is hand me the skull, right? I'll take care of everything else with the customers. So I sold, I believe it was around a hundred of them within 24 hours. Wow. Orders. No so kidding. People were really wanting that. Because this, Adam was kind of next level as far as likenesses go, right? Even more so than what was being produced mainstream. Now that's different now, right? You got companies like InArt that are putting out some amazing portraits and even Hot Toys, you know, it's like people like to jump on the new guys, the bandwagon, but Hot Toys still does incredible work. And for the level of quality that they put out for the number of pieces they release. Yeah, agreed. You can't, you can't just dishonor them, right? They they really have a level of respect that's been earned over the past few decades. Sure. So anyway, I thought, okay, so now I've got to figure out how to make 100, thing, 100 copies of this. I was a little familiar with mold and casting, but I had to do a crash course in that and had to do all that. So it took me nine months to fill those orders. It took forever. But it, it went off without a hitch. And, well, there were a lot of hitches on my side, but not to the customers, right? So we got them done, got them sent out, and people were happy with it. I thought, all right, let's go, round two. He was doing a two-face, and at that time, he decided he didn't want to do that again. So I'm like, okay, well, I like doing this. I think we can offer custom pieces in this market, in the six-scale market, that people may have interest in. So... Um, at the same time, I learned that 3D printing had gotten to a point to where it wasn't just FDM, where it was like, you know, the weed or line type printers. SLA printers were starting to become a little more mainstream. Now, this was before the Form 2s came for shop talk for people that are in 3D printing. This was before Form 2s were out, but there were print shops you could go to that had high-end, like, jewelry printers that you could get high-resolution prints made from. And there was another um, group at the time on some of the forums that were doing digital uh, modeling and then making 3D prints and selling them. And so I started researching that. I thought, okay, so this will work. And I've seen some really interesting, because um, I was a graphic designer at the time, I saw some really interesting stuff posted about people doing 3D portraits and they looked amazing. And I thought, well, if I can get those guys to give me their files, I'll cut them in on it just like I did with Adam and I'll get them 3D printed and make the cast from there. I probably set up about three different artists and every one of them fell through, whether it was scheduling or some other reason, or they kind of were interested, but not really. It just never worked out. So out of frustration, I thought, you know what? I'm just going to see what I can do. And the first project I ever digitally sculpted was because of frustration, not being able to find artists to work with. Because <laughs> at that time I had never sculpted much except for a bust of uh, Del Keon's pit in high school. That was the only thing I'd ever sculpted in my life. And so um, I turned into ZBrush and found out that I had a knack for likenesses. And it just kind of shifted everything from there. So uh, to really wrap this up to where this started becoming more of a profession, I was working as a product designer for a motorsports company. And some of the pieces that I was selling, I was starting to do private commissions at that time. And a painter on one of the forums had painted one of those for a private commission that I did for a client. And a collectibles company put up an ad that says, hey, we're looking for someone to do portraits like Hot Toys level type stuff. Now, I didn't assume that I was at that level, but that's what they were asking for. And this painter was like, hey, look at this guy, you know, and referenced my name. And so a phone call later and I started, I left the job that I was at and started working in the collectibles industry full time starting in 2015. So I've been running full bore on collectibles and commission stuff uh, since 2015. So, so this is a full-time job for you and this is what you do sun up, sun down. It is. Yeah. It has been since, since then. So I think eight years strong now, right? That's fantastic. Wow. Yeah. Very, very cool. Do you still love it as much now full-time as you did when it was, you know, before a hobby, when you were just starting out? 
Uh, I do, but there's also been variety, right? The road that I've been on, the, the what I did in collectibles, I did some portraits, but I ended up doing full statues. And so that's a completely different world than doing portrait work for six scale stuff or accessories. And so, um, you know, professionally, I've got to work with a, a lot of license that I would have, if I told like seven year old me, you're going to work on these types of properties, I would have, there's no way, you know, these are the things that I grew up loving and watching and experiencing as a kid and watching in movie theaters and such that I'll be able to work on those license later on in life. It would have been a dream, you know? And so the, thank God I'm kind of living it and able to do those things full time. So I, I haven't really gotten burnt out because I keep a variety of types of work that I do, you know, whether it's prototyping for, um, toys or merchandise that's going to be sold in stores somewhere or it's some private commission of an actor or a family member that no one's really ever that's that familiar with but it means something to them you know i've done some musician portraits lately that uh are kind of out of left field but i'm happy to do them because it's something different you know so that, there's enough variety even though it's in the same world it keeps it exciting for me personally how do you, uh, so I see a bunch of stuff on your website. Do you want to give a shout out to your website real quick, just so people know where to find you? Yeah, it's uh, Dean, I believe it's Dash Tolliver Dash Studios. Um, I don't have it pulled up. Is it? Um, myshopify.com. Yeah, myshopify.com. I have it linked on Facebook and Instagram. So that's the easy. I guess I always refer people to the links. I don't memorize the URL enough for myself. That's where I get links in our bio go check it out you know and our auto responders if we're not available at the time someone messages me we always have links to point them to so for sure so i see you have a whole bunch of different sculpts on your website that people can come in and pick and choose and a lot of these have different facial expressions um when you're picking a like a, a character that you, that you want to do are you typically thinking i'm going to make this character head sculpt and then i'm going to do four five six seven variations of it based on expression so usually I'll, I, I was usually just doing like a static expression, right? Uh, kind of a one-off. The expressions really kicked in and found out that I, I enjoyed doing them and the, they're really challenging, right? If you get, if you get something subtly off in an expression, it, it ruins the whole portrait. And, um, there's been some, well, I won't get into that. So the, the, <laughs> I don't want really to talk. I know how much work, look, I, there's a lot of people that like to get online and blast if they don't think a portrait is perfect. And it's not that I'm thin skinned, right? I worked in production for digital art and product design. I have no feelings left as far as your work sucks or whatever. Right. <laughs> they need to tell you if they don't like your stuff. So I, I worked in that world enough that I don't, I don't get offended by those things. But at the same time, I know the amount of work that goes into doing a head. So if a company comes out with one and it's not the best likeness in the world, offer critiques, offer helpful information. But just saying it sucks, that, that's someone's hard work they've put into that. You know, so I guess as an artist and even having friends in the collectible or in the customs world, I know what kind of work goes into that. So I'm not going to get on here and start blasting everybody. But if you see something that needs work or, hey, if you focus on this, it'll really help it out. That's great. And I've had people do that to my work and people do that to work that I've done for companies. And they've like, hey, have you considered these comments that have been made? I'm like, yeah, these, some of these are some really good points. And we'll go back and it'll make it a stronger piece. So creative criticism is really good. Just saying it sucks, well, you're just being a bully on a forum somewhere. Like no one cares, right? I mean, you, you're entitled to your opinion. But anyway, so that's why I, that's why I reeled back what I was going to say. I don't want to unload on someone's hard work so no problem I, um, I totally totally agree with you so when the joker uh the solo joker film came out with joaquin phoenix um very expressive performance right you've kind of got two sides of the coin of him being arthur fleck to him being the joker and um a lot of nuance in his performance and quiet moments and things of him just kind of changing experimenting with who he is inside as a character and so forth so i I didn't feel like one, just one static image would be, or one static pose would be good for a facial feature or a facial expression for that figure. So I started playing around with, well, I do the smiling one from the movie promotion and then a more serious stoic one. Well, then he has the condition where he laughs uncontrollably and looks like he's in pain. So I started messing around with some of those and I found I really enjoy doing expressions and it, it 
it gives collectors an option, even if there's a, a mass-produced figure with a really good likeness, maybe there's a particular scene or moment in a film to where they had a certain expression that people really resonated with people. Well, I like to be able to offer that as an option. It may not be something that they wanted to do enough for the license. And sometimes licensors won't allow, you know, we don't want this expression or something because it's not flattering of the actor or actress. But we have the opportunity as as customizers to come in and say, well, here, you know, you can't have a version of this if you want it and make it available. So it, it worked out really good with Joaquin Phoenix. Um, another large expression that I did was the, are you not entertained uh, for um, Gladiator? And then... It's a fantastic sculpt, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. And then uh, the other one was when I started doing Doc Brown recently. So people weren't really happy with the reissue of the... Back to the Future 2 sculpt for the Back to the Future 1 version of Doc Brown. And so I can't think of a more expressive character than Christopher Lloyd in that, you know. So it really gave me an opportunity to do a lot of different variances of he's such a character in that role to kind of bring out who that character was. And so, and then I transfer those into the multiple films. So different hairstyles and so forth. So it starts to go up. I don't always think, hey, I'm going to come out with seven versions. You don't want to give fatigue to people or decision fatigue if someone just wants a custom head sculpt. But I do like to, when the character calls for it, offer a variety of expressions, you know. That's awesome. I think that's a great, uh, great way to do it. And then my follow-up question to that is, do you have a favorite character that you've worked on that you just continually like to mess around with every now and again? Uh... For a long time, it was Joker, for, uh, Heath Ledger's Joker from The Dark Knight. And th this kind of dates me as well uh, as far as being in the hobby. I was one of the first guys. I'm not saying I was the first, but I'm one of the first, at least in the handful, of guys that ever put real hair on a Joker figure. Yeah. And this was when Hot Toys came out with the bank robber Joker. Yeah. So that one, he already had the hair slicked back, so I didn't have to do a whole lot of dremeling. And I would do the hair ads from, you know, using the Tibetan lamb wool that everyone uses now. But, yeah, that was kind of early days in that stuff. And it, now looking back on those, they're not the best <laughs> the best work that all I've ever learning. done. But it was all a learning curve. It's like, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to offer something new here. And that's what I always come to. Like, like I want to give them, one, I want it to look like the thing they like, mm -hmm. whether that's a statue, whether it's a toy, whether it's a six-scale figure. It should look like the thing it's supposed to look like. That's kind of my philosophy with all this. And I do the best I can to make it look like the thing, right? Whether it's a person or an object or a prop or whatever. And then the other side is try things, try new things. Right. You know, is there a way to do this that no one's done it before? You know, so I did that not too long ago when I did some Joker shoes a couple of years back. You know, I found some still shots of what the sole of the shoe looked like on the bottom and has a certain design to it. Right. And I created an ankle peg. I'm like, well, all these figures have these ankle pegs. And when you put socks on them, they have these loose, limp socks and that gap between the bottom of the foot and then the shoe. Because there's always the double-sided barbell ball joint that goes into right. both sides. I thought, why? So I made a socket or I made a uh, joint that's shaped like a, an ankle on a mm -hmm. leg. And so then it fit into the body and then it also plugged into the shoe so you've only got the one swivel point at the ankle of the body, Smart. but it still suited. It still met its purpose, right? It had enough room to have natural foot movement, but it gave the form of an ankle underneath that if you put a sock to it or something like that. So that's been copied a lot since then, but that was something that I thought, well, why isn't anyone doing this, right? So I kind of right. look for those areas of like, hey, let's let's find something innovative here that no one's tried before. So this kind of is a segue into something that I wanted to ask about, because I know uh, we've had some stuff with it, but has somebody ever taken one of your pieces that you, that they purchased from your website and copied it and tried to produce it? Oh yeah. Yeah. eBay's terrible for that. Notorious for it. <laughs> it yeah. Mostly when I was doing, cause you're asking about the piece I've visited, revisited a lot, um, which was Heath Ledger Joker. I've got mm -hmm. three or four versions that have been recast and put on there, but you know, I tried to fight that at first, but after a while, you, you can't you. stop it. So you just, thankfully, people have enough integrity that support artists and they like your work that they'll buy from you and encourage others to buy from you. Because they know that if, if you don't, if you can't sustain what you're doing, then you're just going to stop doing it and they're going to right. miss out on things that they may want to have in their collection. So uh, another thing too, and you mentioned my shop. 
I get mm -hmm. this question a lot. Is this product still available or that? I don't do limited editions unless I have a certificate of authenticity or something or I promote it as a limited edition. I've done a few. Right. Other than that, if something I made five years ago you saw somewhere, more than likely, if it's not on my store, write me and I'll find it for you and I'll make you a copy of it. So I, I'm more of the philosophy of if someone wants it, they can have it. Well, not right. have it. They can buy it. <laughs> sure. I, I'm not just giving out stuff. No, so don't, don't, don't go there. Support the artist. Yeah. Right. But there, if, I don't know, I guess I understand the concept of I wanted a limited edition piece of art, right? Mm -hmm. I'm looking at uh, dipping the toes into the pool of doing completed figures, a limited run of those. So I understand that there is a market in a world for that. Yep. But for just doing unpainted uh, portraits, I, I feel if anyone wants one, they should be able to get it if they're wanting to upgrade their figures. So I don't do closed in like that. If they're on my site, they're on my site and they're going to stay there. And if anyone's seen something on Instagram that I did a few years ago, just take a look around in my shop. It's more than likely still available. So you specialize in the head sculpt uh, portion of this stuff. Do you uh, see yourself doing anything with like uh, different props or different uh, scaled items besides head sculpts or something like that. Yeah. So it's, it's nothing, it's a little bit grueling for me to do these, but I do boots. I've done mm -hmm. shoes and boots for various films. Um, I did a set of Indiana Jones boots not long mm -hmm. ago. Um, I did a private commission for a set of boots from Shawshank Redemption. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to me doing shoe and boot works a little tedious, but mm -hmm. it is fun because it's a challenge. You know, there's, it's not just a basic form and some stitches and whatever. It, it, the, people want these to look like certain things. And again, that, that requires research. Who made the, who, I spent probably two hours a couple of weeks ago. So one of the first figures that I've been teasing on a forum that I want to do is a completed Billy with Gizmo from the movie Gremlins, right? Mm, and that'd be sweet, man. As well. So I wanted to do that project either in statue form, and I've settled on six scale articulated figure for a number of years now. And so I was probably probably spent about two hours or so just trying to find out what shoes he had. Right. <laughs> what that is, is you see what color and you start typing in vintage boots, 1980. You think, well, the movie came out in 85, I think. So you're probably looking at the 83 to 82 for production. So or 84 rather. So you go back and you start looking for what was popular around that time, you know, right. and, start, and I found them. I found the exact shoes that he had on. <laughs> it was so a brand. Funny. I didn't even know that were running product back then. So I think right. it was New Balance. I didn't know they went all the way back into the 80s. It just wasn't a brand that I ever had. So anyway, I was able to find that. So that it's a fun but tedious side to it is looking up that stuff. So yeah, I, I've done accessories before, uh, weapons, helmets. Uh, I did the BVS um, when when the BVS movie came out, Zack Snyder's. In the fight scene, this was before Hot Toys released the battle damage version. Mm -hmm. um, he gets in the fight in the full armor with Superman, and Superman breaks part of the face mask off. And so... Uh, Hot Toys finally came out with the battle damage, but they had part of it. He still had like the eye, the yep. glide up eye on one side. Well, he didn't in the movie, right? So I, I knocked it out and I had two face plates that you could swap out in that to, for two different expressions. And it just set by friction on top of the figure. Sweet. And then there you go. You had two options for expression swap outs. So that kind of stuff. I like doing that sort of thing. So that's kind of an accessory and a portrait tied in together. Um, but yeah, I, I haven't done a whole lot of weapons. That's, mm -hmm. um, I find custom weapons can be a little fragile because I do print on demand. Yep. I don't do casting work. Um, I, you know, I used to do print. A, I used to work with a company called Vision Proto. And so anyone's looking for print houses out there, if they're still around, they do great work. I used to get my masters from them and then I would do mold and cast. I would mm -hmm. have higher out the molding and casting. I don't like seam lines and right. it's inevitable with molding and casting. Well, when printing technology, the consumer-based printing technology got to a point to where the consistency and quality was where I would, thought it needed to be. Mm -hmm. I now do everything print on demand. I don't do casts and copies of anything. Everything I do comes right off of a printer. I do the post-processing, clean it up, sand it, and send it off because that's the truest form of what I put on the screen when I made the model. Yep. Yep. And so to me, they're not getting a stage down or a shrunken mold or starting to get wear on the pools different things that you run into with mold and cast. Um, 
so I'm able to get them the same quality of a prototype every time. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's why I switched over to that. That being said, 3D printed resin does have its limitations and weapons, swords bend really bad. Mm -hmm. And so really small things can be really fragile. So some of that stuff, I'm like, you know, there's other guys that do really good work. Some guys that do like the metal work for weapons and so forth. And like, hey, let's keep those guys busy. That's their wheelhouse. Yep. I'll stick with what I know. You know. Sure, sure. So you you would say that your specialty is head sculpts and expressions that they were to knock it out. Uh, at least for customizing, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I also do full statues, and I've had some private commissions of doing full statue work. Uh, focus a lot in three D printing. I've done three D printing prototypes mm -hmm. for tooling masters for things that go to mass production. So yeah, I'm kind of all over the place. And uh, I worked for a company for five years, and in 2020 they cease to operate. And so mm -hmm. I'm like, well, what am I going to do? This is what I know. This is what I love to do. So I started the studio under my own name. I used to go by Craig Customs, C-R-E-G yep. Customs, if anyone knows me from back in the forum. Back in the day, man. Or, or Sideshow Freaks. I rebranded to my name because the, I was known in the industry more by just my name from working for that company. And so I thought, you know what? I have enough connections. I know enough mm -hmm. people. I know enough about manufacturing. I can offer myself as a plug and play digital art um, department for anyone that doesn't have prototyping capabilities. And so I've served in that capacity, you know, um, a, a couple of years around 2020. Actually, I never had a gap, thank God. So when I left, no. when, I, when I was uh, let go from that company because they let everyone go, I never had a miss to jump right into my next job. I started doing development work for GameStop. And so they were doing private label merchandising. They went out, they had their license, but they had no way to make it. So a previous colleague that I had worked with was working there. And uh, like, hey, if you got anything, let me know. And they were starting up their own statue program in-house. And so, man, I got to work on some things that were fantastic there. I did some Dungeons & Dragons merchandise. Cool. Uh, uh, they did a statue of the gel cube. That's one of the favorite pieces I've ever done, actually, for production work. Uh, and I was able to... It, this one didn't go to market, unfortunately, but I got to design my own version of Optimus Prime and Megatron that was approved by oh. Hasbro. So that was like, what? That's <laughs> awesome, man. So, here I'm in a situation where I'm getting to design Transformers, the two of the you know two of the most well-known ones ever. And uh, you know, like How I cool. said... That, they pulled the plug on that project because of they decided to focus on something else. But yeah, I still got to do it. But I did do the helmets, right? The, they had the Transformer helmets in GameStop for a while. Mm -hmm. So I did the modeling on all the main characters of those and got to do those. So yeah, it's just some really dream projects to be, to be able to work on. So yeah, privately on the commission and customizing side it's focusing heavily on six scale steel and head sculpts but yeah i'm, I'm kind of all over the place for prototyping so all of my professional work is usually dealing with statues that's awesome and and you said what scale are those one quarter scale so 18 inches or uh well it depends yeah it depends on the client and what the project is now the stuff for gamestop their statues were one tenth scale so they were about eight inches tall mm -hmm. and like the the one of them that i ended up developing we had a couple of production hurdles on how to make this work it was the gel cube from dungeons and dragons and this isn't the movie this was just for the property dungeons and dragons right and this so this i did all the prototyping for this and it went to market and um so there's a guy floating in here a skeleton inside of a clear plastic cube with a bunch of things floating around them so it's like well how do you do that right how do you do That's that man? It's <laughs> like, how, are we, how are we gonna make this work so i've got an arm sticking out and a leg sticking out and so I had to go in and do the concept for the cube of what it would look like and how it would go together. And there's a clear support floating the guy up on the inside. So when you look at it, it looks like he's just free floating. But for production and shipping, he's secured in there by, you know, supports underneath him. So you know, a lot of things you have to think about. Yeah, I, I love that part of it. Well, that definitely keeps it very fresh. Like you were saying, like you have a lot of variety of what you're doing, which definitely I feel like helps you probably not feel burnt out and and so so glad for you that you were able to transition so smoothly from you know that company that that ceased to operate and continuing to work and not having a big gap that is definitely wonderful that's a win yeah yeah that's definitely a win so thinking about like your 
your commissions and if somebody wanted to work with you for a project, how long does it take to do like a one-off project for you? And then like, what's your wait time right now for people who are interested? So I've, for commissions, I've got about a wait until November to December. I have about five of those that I have to fulfill right now currently. Uh, for statue work, that's uh, kind of come... It, it, I don't get enough private commissions for that. It's usually companies, so I kind of juggle around my schedule of company work for those. Now, when I actually do have a commission for doing a head sculpt, I, I do juggle that in with my company work, and so those typically take me about two to four weeks. That's a really good turnaround time. Yeah. If I have a clear schedule, I can knock out a I can knock out a head sculpt within one week. So wow. that's you know that's not a challenge if time allows. It usually doesn't, and I have to juggle it in with everything else. So now if it's a project of my own, sometimes it can take about two years to get around to it. Sure. I'll put stuff on sure. Instagram and I'm like, hey, when is this coming out? You know, they'll keep asking and asking. I'll keep posing updates or teasers or something. All right. It's like, well, after I get my private commissions done, after I get my statue work done for companies, you know, then I'll get around to that. So it kind of takes a back seat, but I'm, I'm really slow on getting my own projects out, uh, but not so much for clients, thankfully. Well, that's good. because the clients are the ones making you money as opposed to your own projects, which are more just, you know. <laughs> um, so, so thinking about, you know, how you've learned and how technology has learned and grown through this process that you've been, you know, using 3D printing to do head sculpts now, what are some of your favorite tools, programs, materials to work with when you're creating these custom head sculpts or statues? What are your favorites? Okay. Uh, I'm exclusively a ZBrush guy. You know, I, I came into this when it was ZBrush and Mudbox were the two top sculpting programs and everyone thought Mudbox was going to win. Now I'm not, <laughs> I'm not trashing on people who like Mudbox, but ZBrush really kind of seemed to jump to the front of uh, being really ideal for 3D printing, right? So at least to me, they've got a lot of tools that are easily accessible to help in that progress or process rather. So I've got a Wacom tablet that I use. Um, it's like a 30, I think it's a 28 or 32 inch that I, that's, that's my baby. I love working on that thing. And uh, so ZBrush that I have incorporated Blender a little bit lately and that's to work for posing. I've had some clients that want some hands from statues reposed, and instead of resculpting that, I've kind of done a crash course on my own of learning how to take those out of ZBrush into Blender, rigging them, and so then I could 3D pose them with that rigging, and then export it back out into ZBrush. So I'm kind of developing workflows to expedite those kind of processes and really kind of open up possibilities of what can be done. Are you are you printing in resin, mostly resin, or are you using any other type of uh, types of resin, like the uh, you know the soft resin, tough resin, stuff like that? So I do. Uh, I use like a standard um, resin. I, it's the same mix that uh, the doggy dog does actually. So he I actually got the color blend from him, right? There's uh, the frozen. Uh, to get into shop talk, frozen makes an AK resin in, in vanilla color and red clay and if you take about a quarter of the red clay and mix it with the vanilla you get a really close flesh tone that is um, it's a little blown out from the light here but it's really close to the base color of like a hot toys head sculpt if you strip all the paint off of it so we're so we're trying to give someone the painters something close now some guys will just prime it gray or whatever they've got their own processes but I've had people tell me, hey, we love the color that you use for your resin. I was able to do washes just directly on the print and go from there. So while everyone doesn't use the benefit of the flesh tone, it looks good in photographs, right? And it's cool to see in hand. It can show you a lot of the details. And some people take advantage of it for their painting process and some people don't. But either way, it's there as an option if they want it. But everything, all the heads that I sell are done in a flesh tone. That is fantastic, actually. Wow, very cool. I didn't know that, so that's really and neat. So I have a couple of characters. I've had a lot of people asking about my. I did a John Wick recently. I uh, did a Keanu with a with the angry expression, <laughs> <laughs> right? I'd like one. <laughs> and so I teased a hair version, but the hair was a little too fragile to do all in regular resin. And so then I created a little bit of a complicated scenario. Like, well, I've got to figure out how to get the hair off and make it in a flexible resin, not where it's rubbery, but at least it won't be brittle and crack and break. 
but then it also has to be able to clear the collar because he wears suits but has longer hair, especially when you get into like three and four. I'm going to do hair versions for all four movies, or at least for three of them. His hair is really different in at least three of the films. And so I've got to be able to clear the suit so when you assemble the figure, he can actually still look like he's supposed to with the suit collar up high enough. And then uh, I also have an issue now. I don't want a bad-looking hairline which isn't the problem with me, but <laughs> for characters with long hair, you want it to be, right? You want it to look natural. And so not just have a cut where it looks like a, an action figure, like, I mean, like a 112 scale action figure where it's just two pieces glued together. You want it to blend in a little bit better. So I've been doing a lot of R and D with how to make that look good. And then also be playing around with some resin to, to give a little bit of flexibility to it, but still maintain the, the small fine details in the hair, the, the messy hair is what I'm going for, right? It's pretty cut and dry if you just do the clean hair sculpt, but I'm wanting to do, since it's a more aggressive expression on his face, I'm wanting to do the disheveled hair where he's like in the middle of fighting because that's an option again. I think his head looks pretty good on Hot Toys, but some people may want to have him in the middle of a fight pose or something. So I'm trying to give them an option to where hey, this looks really cool, like he's killing somebody, you know, to fit the character. So yeah, I want to see him like like minute forty three of the forty five minute fight. In yeah, the last right. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm going for. It's just taking a little bit longer to develop that again because that's a personal project. It has to kind of take a backseat or at least a side seat to everything else first. So. That's awesome. I can't wait to see that. But I haven't forgot everybody that's wanting one. Yeah, well, put me down for one or two, um, for sure. So you briefly mentioned, and I just want to throw this out there before I forget it. Um, you briefly mentioned that you do painting and you do rooted hair work. Do you still do that, or is that something somebody could hire you to do? No, my the level that I left off on painting was very, very, very base. And so, um, and because of the time that it takes to do the modeling work, I never pursued it any further. So at this at this time, I don't offer painting services. Now, I, I do for some things, like for some accessories that I've done before and stuff like that, I've offered some painted features. But typically, anything I put on my store, if it's not advertised as such, I don't offer a painted option for it. As much as I would like to, I just don't have the time to be able to do it. So some of the private commission stuff that I've done, you know, some hats or shoes or something I have done before, but that's more of a one-off commission scenario than it is, hey, I bought this off your store. Can you paint it for me? I don't have the ability to offer painting services at that time. So Cool. That's good to know. Which, you know, there's a good community of painters out there. And so one thing I love about this, about this hobby, and I got to give a shout out to uh, Dave Steffens from back in the day of Sideshow Freaks. I know a lot of guys who have careers because of the custom section of that forum. You know, I know some things went down there and they had to split that off and, you know, different things a few years back. But well, I'm talking like back around 2009, 2010, the, that's really kind of where the birth, at least in the U.S., I, I don't know about overseas, but I think it probably kind of went reverse back overseas with the custom stuff. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the market for custom figures was born in that thread, I think. You know, Rain Man, he was doing his own amazing work. Wow, right? Yeah. In, right? And that, that was independent of Sideshow Freaks, even though his stuff was focused on there or featured. Um, but anyway, I, there's a lot of guys that have careers now because of those forums, and uh, I'm one of them, right? So uh, one of the other artists on there, Sean Dabbs, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, he actually, I, we used to work together. So, but he taught me ZBrush. I'm like, hey, wow. man, I'm trying to do the sculpting thing. How does this work? What do you do with this? What do you do with that? You know, there was a real sense of community and everyone helping each other out. And he helped me learn the basics of ZBrush and, you know, the rest is history. But so, yeah, it's just kind of, I just want to give a shout out to that old forum because man, it, it yeah, launched man. a lot of guys into the collectibles industry. For sure. Totally agree with you. So Dean, I have a, like one last big question before we do our fun little rapid fires. So what advice would you give to someone who's just starting out in this, you know, action figure art field? They aren't really sure maybe where to start or, or what their strengths are. Like, what would your advice be to them? Um, I would experiment a lot with, to find out what you're good at. You know, I, I stayed away from, so in, in 3D sculpting, there's organic modeling and hard surface modeling. 
which organic sculpting would be monsters or humans, you know, bodies, faces, that sort of thing. And then hard surface would be what it sounds like, anything metallic or machined or um, accessories, desks, simple things, even complicated things. Those are two different types of sculpting methods, right? I stayed away from hard surface modeling for years because it was very intimidating to me. And uh, probably about three to five years ago, I, st I kind of had a necessity for scheduling, for getting products to market. I had to start dabbling in it. And now I love doing hard surface modeling stuff. Now, I, I avoided it for a long time because I thought, well, I'm not good at that. That's its own thing. Well, once I gave myself time to adapt to it and try it out, I thought, hey, I can do this too. So don't be afraid to try new things, right? You know, you don't have to share it online <laughs> if you don't like how it looks. But give it a shot and see, you know, see how you are with it. So it's really about seeing what you're good at, what makes you happy too. I don't openly ask for a lot of shoe commissions because it's not my favorite thing in the world to do, right? So... I'll do them if I'm approached, but I don't advertise it because I don't love doing it. So, you know, it's it's that kind of thing. If you don't don't put yourself out there for something you don't find a lot of joy in because you'll get burnt out really quick and that's not a good road to take. Yep. I totally agree with that. And I think uh that that, that kind of sums it up for me. I mean, over the years what I've learned as far as this being a customizer and, and really liking this this industry is you don't have to be good at everything. I think a lot of people try to try to do everything on a figure when really you should specialize and do what really makes you happy making the figure and then leave the rest to somebody else who's really good at it. Exactly. So I, I teased earlier about the Billy and Gizmo that I'm going to do, right? I, I'll do the portrait and the shoes <laughs> yeah. Gizmo and his box and all the accessories I have planned. I'm not a tailor. I'm not even going to pretend to. So I'm going to right. find people that are really good at that and let them do what they shine in, right? And bring it all together and make a cool product for someone. That's that's when everything's firing good on all cylinders is when you let people do what they're really good at. Yep. Now, 100%. if you're wanting to do this as a business, I do have a couple of other things. A personal opinion, um, stay out of religion and politics. If you're running yep. a business, run a business. If you're running, your personal opinions are fine. Everyone's entitled to them and their own thoughts and ideologies, but they don't really belong in the business place if that's not what your business is. Right. And so I've seen people really fall on bad lists of like, well, this group hates them and this group loves them over divisive issues. And I'm Switzerland online, right? That no one cares about what my personal thoughts and beliefs are on things. They want to see my art. So that's what right. my online presence is about is my art that I do. And so uh, as far as um, business goes, you have to consider these things if you're gonna turn what you do into a business. Yep. And you have to be able to talk to customers. And if you're not good at certain things, find people in your circle that can help you with it that are good at it. You know, sometimes with organizing things, my brain is like hurting, you know, like trying to wrestle in a herd of cats, right? Sure. I'm creatively wired. That's where my world is. I could stay on the tablet here for 40 hours, not blink, right? I have a hard time sometimes with what orders do we have now and what's going out? Thank God, I married a woman who's really gifted in those things. And so... Yeah, me too. I, <laughs> right? I, it took me nine months to get those casts out that I told you about earlier, those Bruce Waynes when I first started doing this as a business. And now I get a product out and in the mail within, I think it's um, five to seven business days. That's very so good. So she set up our web store. She maintains all of that, does our customers. She set up everything is automated and, uh, and well organized. And God bless her for it because those are not my strengths. And I used to sit down and write out mail labels by hand and international mail labels by hand. And that's right. A, <laughs> oh my gosh, that's a dreadful thing to do. <laughs> So thankfully everything's streamlined now and we always yeah. point people to our store. Hey, you order on there and you, you get all your you tracking, go. everything's in place. So, yeah. so yeah, if those were real weaknesses for me, but thankfully those were her strong suit. So if you don't have someone like that, it doesn't have to be a partner, find a friend or someone that you can maybe help them out a little bit and, and uh, maybe even pay them on a part-time basis if they can help you out. Cause Again, if you're going into a business, you got to treat it as a business and think of it as a business. If you're if you're going from hobby into business and you're starting to involve money and in people's time and their hard-earned money that they're giving you for a service, 
you've got to be able to follow through and don't be afraid to correct things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I posted on Facebook last night. I started selling some Bruce Wayne sculpts. Um, I had a Dark Knight version and a smiling version of Christian Bale as Bruce Wayne. Mm -hmm. And I scaled those to an old Hot Toys Bruce Wayne head, which some of those can be a little undersized. And I had someone write me like, man, I really like this piece, but I feel like it's too small. And so I went back and looked at it and sure enough, it is it is underscaled to today's figures because that was a little, an older head that I scaled it to. Right. And so I put on there, hey, if you've ordered one of these heads from me, I'm giving you a free replacement for an upscaled size if you want it, just let me know. Because some people may be happy with that scale, but others mm -hmm. not. And I've had a lot of people take me up on that offer. You know, I, I'm okay to eat that mistake that it was a little undersized because I did it to an old head sculpt release. So, you know, it, you don't just like dust your hands up and say, well, too right. late, the transaction's over. If you want a short-lived business, you treat people that way. If you want longevity, and man, we've seen a lot of custom guys come and go in this field, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but you, you've got to treat people with respect and run a business with integrity, and then people will come back. I have a lot of repeat customers, right? Thankfully, and it's because I always take care of them. So that's fantastic. I think customer service is absolutely huge, and, and I think doing you know fixing your mistake if you make one, I think it's a it's a win win for everybody. So these are just rapid fire <laughs> questions. First thing that comes to your mind. Are you ready? I'll give it a shot. All right. What's your favorite movie? Uh, Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters. <laughs> Love it. That's a good what's one. Your favorite, what's your favorite holiday? Christmas. It fed the beast when I was a kid, and it continues to this day. <laughs> yeah, me too. Uh, next one. Deadpool or Wolverine? Wolverine. He's the best there is at what he does. <laughs> uh, what did you want to be when you grew up? Uh, depends on what era. The first time I remember wanting to be something, clearly... Now, I was, I was drawing posters of Ninja Turtles and construction equipment when I was like in elementary school, right? But I never thought, oh, I want to be an artist. I just like to draw. First time I ever knew that I wanted to be something was a Navy fighter pilot <laughs> around That's the time the Top Gun came out. Of course. And then I had an uncle that went into the, into the Air Force, and I found out you had to go through like so many years of flight school. I was like, well, that doesn't sound so fun after all, you know? <laughs> so that was a short-lived dream, right? And... uh after that, especially in high school, I wanted to be a comic book artist. So I did graphic design and sequential wasn't really my thing, but I really wanted it to be. So I wanted, I wanted to do comics for a long time. It's awesome. awesome. My, my three-year-old sees the fighter jets in the sky. He goes, Maverick, it's Maverick. Mom. <laughs> I think sometimes he thinks right now he wants to be a fighter pilot. Yeah. But he also wants yep. to be a shark and a dinosaur. So we'll see what he lands on. All three are viable options. Yeah. Right? All three. Yes. <laughs> so what profession or job would you never want to do? Um, outside of high school, I worked at a lot of factories. I'm not wired for that. God bless those who are. And uh, so I know a lot of people who are and they've had long careers doing so and love their jobs. I monot That kind of monotony, if it's something that interests me, I can be monotonous for end on end, right? But that kind of work, I just, I'm not wired for it. So I wouldn't want to go back to a factory unless I had to keep food on the table. All right, next question. Xbox or PlayStation? Um, PlayStation. PlayStation. I'm going to say Xbox is for kids just to troll my son because he likes to trash <laughs> PlayStation a lot. <laughs> sure. It's not really, but I like to say that. <laughs> if you were a menu item at a restaurant, what would your entree be called? <laughs> the old and tired. <laughs> That's not the most appetizing title. <laughs> oh. There's no price. They just give it away if they can get anyone to take it, right? It's the leftovers. <laughs> <laughs> Better slip, probably a meat dish, right? So, <laughs> What is your, your favorite curse word? Um, I don't know that I have one. That, one that I always thought was humorous was the phrase ape shit. That always, for some reason, I found humor in that, so... And do you have a zombie apocalypse escape plan? Um, no. Actually, I don't. That was so quick. Yeah. <laughs> like, no. And last one, sum up what you do in three words. Make cool stuff. Ooh, oh. I love it. Ooh. Cut that. That's good. <laughs> well, Dean, thank you so much for chatting with us, for giving us a peek inside your, your story and your process, and I hope that 
the people um, watching are not going to request a whole bunch of shoes from you, but yep. very cool <laughs> statues and heads. You can buy the ones I sell on there all day. I'll print all as many long. as they want, but not, right? But not, not any, I hope you don't get an onslaught of like custom <laughs> shoes or <laughs> Oh, I know a guy. Yeah. But thank you so much. It's been such a such a joy to chat with you today. Well, thank you guys for the time and thanks for having me on. Thanks for listening. If you like this episode, please share the show. Share it on your social media and share it with your friends. We don't really care how you share it. Just share the show. Until next time. <laughs> <laughs>